بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام الأتمان الأكملان على خير خلق الله أجمعين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهديه واستنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وأرنا الحق حقا ورزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا ورزقنا اجتنابه وجعلنا ممن يستمعون القول فيتبعون أحسنه رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Alhamdulillah, we previously covered the Amthal al-Qur'an, the parables of the Qur'an. Although it was done completely online without anyone attending physically, we started after Ramadan and completed it about a month ago. And we covered approximately 40 40 something parables from the Quran amthal or parables from the Quran and so now we move on to the parables in the sunnah the parables the amthal that were mentioned by the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam And before we get into the parables, it would be nice to have a brief introduction about amthal, about parables. What do we mean when we say a mathal, a parable? And before that, we can also mention that the Prophet ﷺ, he was a da'i, he was not only the Prophet and the Messenger of Allah, but he was a da'i and a teacher. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent him to guide all of humanity. Teaching us the message of Allah, explaining it to us like a teacher would explain whatever he wants to teach to his students. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, describing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, هُوَ الَّذِي بَعَثَ فِي الْأُمِّيِّينَ رَسُولًا يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَإِنْ كَانُوا مِنْ قَبْلُ لَفِي ضَلَالٍ مُبِينٍ It is Allah who sent or who raised for the illiterate because the Arabs were illiterate. They didn't know how to read or write. So Allah sent the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah says He sent him as a messenger among the illiterate to recite to them His words, His revelation. To purify them. him. And the third thing, to teach them. To teach them the book, the kitab, and al-hikmah, the wisdom. And so the wisdom behind Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sending Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was to teach us. And as such, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala equipped him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with the tools that he needed in order to be an effective teacher. And so his entire life is filled with examples of effective teaching methods that you, that you cannot find in any other person in history. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala gave him the tools to be an effective teacher. And so he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used different ways of getting his message across. He used stories, al mawa'idah admonition, which includes Targheeb and Targheeb. Targheeb to encourage us to do good. 
tarheeb, to discourage us from doing evil. And convincing arguments. And also on top of all of that, parables. Amthal. So these are all different teaching methods. And just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses amthal, uses parables in the Quran to get his message across to us in a simple convincing way, likewise, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used amthal, parables, as a teaching method to teach his companions, to teach them various concepts on various occasions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about parables in the ayat that we recited in Salah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَتِلْكَ الْأَمْثَالُ نَضْرِبُهَا لِلنَّاسِ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ these are parables that we present to people for what purpose? So that they will give thought, so that they will think, they will reflect. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ ضَرَبْنَا لِلنَّاسِ فِي هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ مِنْ كُلِّ مَثَلٍ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَذَكَّرُونَ And indeed we presented to the people in this Qur'an every kind of parable for what purpose so that they may remember and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presented parables in the Quran he presented them for us to reflect over them and to try to attempt to understand this message that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent now when we say method what do we mean a method a literal translation would be a parable or a similitude or an example. And this exists in all languages of the world. But parable can mean one of two things. A parable can mean one of two things. Either a figure of speech which presents a short story at the end you have a moral lesson that you learn from that short story and so for example we have the boy who cried wolf it's a short story about a boy who would always cry wolf and so he would lie he would tell the people there is a wolf. But that was not the case. Then at the end, what happens? When he cries wolf, and there actually was a wolf, the people didn't believe him. And so they left him, and he was eaten by the wolf. At the end of this short story, we have a moral lesson. And that is, to speak the truth. And to be aware of, to be aware of the danger of lying. Another example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an, وَضْرِبْ لَهُمْ مَثَلًا وَضْرِبْ لَهُمْ مَثَلًا رَجُلَيْنِ جَعَلْنَا لِأَحَدِهِمْ جَنَّتَانِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Kahf gives us the parable of the two men. And so it's a short story that Allah mentions of two men. One, Allah had given him a lot of wealth, he had, a, he had two farms, two gardens, but he was arrogant. And the other one, he had nothing. And because of his arrogance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroys his, his garden. And leaves, leaves him with nothing. And so this is a short story. Allah referred to it as a method. That's the point here. Allah refers to it as a method, a parable. From the Sunnah, we have many examples of short stories with a moral lesson. What is an example? 
who can give us an example? A short story with a moral lesson at the end of it. That the Prophet ﷺ gave us. Hmm. We have the famous story of the prostitute who entered Jannah because she gave she gave that dog that was thirsty she gave him water to drink and so the lesson that we learn from that is that we shouldn't underestimate small good deeds because they could be a reason for you entering Jannah even though you had big sins and many other examples of short stories that the Prophet ﷺ gave us, at the end of which was a moral lesson. So this is the first thing that a parable can mean. The second thing that a method, a parable can mean, is a statement that conveys a meaning by comparing two things. By comparing two things, which have common aspects between them. Usually the thing being compared to is something that we are familiar with, something that we can relate to. And so examples of this are the parables of the Qur'an, the amthal of the Qur'an. And so for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alam tara? كَيْفَ ضَرَبَ اللَّهُ مَثَلًا كَيْفَ ضَرَبَ أَلَمْ تَرَى كَيْفَ ضَرَبَ اللَّهُ مَثَلًا كَلِمَةً طَيِّبَةً كَشَجَرَةٍ طَيِّبَةٍ Do you not see how Allah presents a parable, an example of the good word? That it is like the good tree. Here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is comparing what to what? Allah is comparing the shahada, the kalima of tawheed, to a good strong tree. And many other examples in the Quran and all the parables that we covered in the last class, they were these parables, where Allah compares one thing to another. And this kind of parable, this is what we will be covering, insha'Allah ta'ala, over the next several weeks in this class, in this halaqah. This is what we will be covering. This kind of parable. And so from the sunnah, we have many examples. One example is the Prophet wasallam drew a line in the sand. He drew a line in the sand. And then he drew diverging lines to the right and the left of this one line in the middle. So here he was giving us a method, an example. And so he said, this is the straight path. And these other paths, these other lines are the deviations, the deviant paths that are going to the hellfire. Ibn Qayyim, he also gives a parable of this kind, comparing one thing to another. And this is his own analogy. He says, he gives us the parable of good deeds and how they grow, how our good deeds, they grow and they become something huge. He says, the example of good deeds, cultivating, growing, and increasing, is that of a seed that you plant in the ground. It turns into a tree, then it gives fruits, then you eat its fruits, and then you plant its seeds. From these new fruits, you take the seeds and you plant them. Every time the new tree gives fruits, you pick its fruits and you plant its seeds. It continues. It's everlasting. It keeps on growing. And then he says, 
the same thing can be said about the result, the evil result of sins. Sins, they have the same result. And so these are two, these are two things, these are two different things when we say parable. When we say parable, it could either mean a short story with a moral lesson or it could mean comparing two things where the thing being compared to is something that we can relate to, something that we are familiar with. Now, what is the purpose of parables? What is the purpose of parables? Why do, why do people give parables? Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us parables in the Qur'an? Why did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa give us parables? For al people can understand better or Yeah, exactly. Parables, they help us to understand concepts that sometimes we would not understand or it's difficult to understand. And I'm sure all of us we've been through that where we went to school and we had certain teachers that would just teach the concepts without giving examples they would teach the concepts without giving examples and we would leave the class not understanding anything but i'm sure we've had teachers who explain the concepts by giving us examples and those examples meant everything to us to understand the concepts. And so parables, they help to understand difficult concepts by giving us shared experiences. To feel as if we are directly involved in these experiences. And so by using carefully selected parables, Remote tr truths, remote concepts are made nearer to us, are made more con uh, comprehensible by us. And so parables are one of the best teaching tools because, you know, they, they use symbolic imagery and metaphors that we can picture in our minds that we can easily recognize. Because we have seen those things before. We have seen those things before. And so you can convey, you know, complicated truths and concepts in such a way that they become relatable to us. And there's two examples I want to mention from the lives of our scholars of the past. What, the first example is the story of Imam al-Kasai and the boy. Imam al-Kasai and the boy. Imam al-Kasai was one of the great scholars from the second century, the second Hijri century. He was a scholar of the Arabic language and the Qira'at. For those of you who are familiar with the Qira'at, we have various Qira'at, and each one is named after an Imam. The one that we recite, the one that we know, is which one? No, no, no. Uh, we're talking about the Qira'at of the Qur'an. Hafs. An Asim. Hafs was the student of Imam Asim. So this qira'ah is named after him. One of the qira'at is named after Imam al Kasai. The qira'ah of Imam al Kasai. It's a different way of reciting. Imam al Kasai, he was a shepherd until the age of about 40 years until the age of 40 years, he was a shepherd. 
He was not a scholar. He was not a student of knowledge. He was a shepherd until the age of 40. One day, he passed by a mother who was encouraging her son to go to the masjid to attend his Quran halaqah. But he didn't want to go. So she said to her son, and she looked at Imam al Kasai. She said, My son, go to the halaqa to learn so that when you become older, you don't become like this shepherd. And so Imam al Kasai, until now, he's a shepherd. He says, when I heard those words, I said, I have been made an example of ignorance. I have been made a parable of ignorance. People are using me to give the example of what it means to be ignorant. So he says, I went and I sold my flock of sheep and then I went and started studying and seeking knowledge until Imam al Kasai became who he became a leading scholar in the Arabic language, in the Qira'at, until, as we said, a Qira'a until today is named after him. And so, after, after being an example for ignorance, he became he became an example of knowledge. He became an example of, of determination, of high aspiration. Who at the age of 40 goes and learns and then becomes a scholar? A story like this would motivate us, if anything at all. But the point was, the point was the importance of examples. The second story is the story of Al-Jahid and the woman. Al-Jahid was also a scholar from the third century. He was from the Mu'tazila, but he was very strong in the Arabic language. He was a scholar of the Arabic language and poetry and Arabic literature. Al-Jahid was once walking in the market when a woman, she came to him and she asked him, can you accompany me to the goldsmith? A random stranger, this woman, she comes to him and she says, come with me to the goldsmith. So he went with her and when they reached the goldsmith, the woman, she said to the goldsmith, she said, like the face of this man. And she pointed to Al-Jahid. So Al-Jahid, he was completely clueless. He didn't know what was going on. So after the woman left, he turned to the goldsmith and he asked, what was she talking about? So the goldsmith, he said, this woman, she came to me and she wanted me to engrave an image of shaitan on her ring and so i said i've never seen shaitan so i don't know i've never seen shaitan i don't know how he looks so she went and she brought you to me and she pointed to you and said like you meaning that you look like shaitan and Al-Jahid was not very handsome. He was actually named Al-Jahid because of his, his eyes that were very large and bulging. And that's the meaning of Al-Jahid, basically. So once again, once again, we see how a parable was used, an example was used. When you don't understand something, you have to 
give an example. Because an example, it makes what is not understandable, it makes it understandable. A concept that you don't understand. It becomes clear when an example is given. And so this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used parables in the Qur'an. So that no one has any excuse. The entire Qur'an is filled with either convincing arguments or parables or stories that make everything clear. And that's why Allah says that the Qur'an was revealed as something clear. Kitabun Mubin, bilisanin Arabi and Mubin. It doesn't require it doesn't require you to go and study something in order to understand the message of the Qur'an. And the parables just add to the clarification. So that no one can come on the Day of Judgment and say, Oh Allah, I didn't understand this concept. In the Qur'an, Allah gives us parables concerning Iman and Kufr. Concerning Tawheed and Shirk. Concerning Resurrection. He gives us parables that help us to understand these concepts. And so, the usage of parables in the Qur'an and in the Sunnah are used for various reasons. Or we can say that the Qur'an and the Sunnah consist of a variety of different kinds of parables for a variety of objectives. So sometimes to clarify a point, other times to convince you of the truth of something, other times to encourage you to do something good. In Surah Al-Baqarah we have the parable of as sadaqah Of the sadaqah that you give which is sincere. And the other sadaqah that you give which is not sincere. So parables are used to encourage us to do good. Parables are also used to encourage us or uh, discourage us and to warn us from doing something haram. For example, al ghiba Allah gives us the example of al ghiba in Surah Al-Hujurat. That what is, what is backbiting like? It is like you go and you eat the flesh of your Muslim brother. And also, the Prophet ﷺ gave us many parables of, uh, that warn us from doing certain haram things. Also, parables have been used in the Qur'an and Sunnah to clarify the difference between two opposing things. So, in the Qur'an, Allah gives us the parable of, the, of Iman and Kufr. And of the Muwahid and the Mushrik. In one parable, Allah gives us the example. What is a person of Tawheed like and what is a person of Shirk like? So in one parable, for example, Allah says that the Mushrik is like a slave who has more than one master. How is he going to be able to obey all of them. How is he going to please all of his masters? Allah says, this is what a mushrik is like. And then Allah says, what is the muwahid like? The person of tawheed? He is like someone who only has one master. He is only responsible to obey one master. And so he can easily please that one master. He can easily please that one master. And so you, worshipping Allah alone, you are able to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah will then become pleased with you. As opposed to the mushrik, who has several masters, he can't please them all. Also the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa gives us the parable of two opposing things. The example of the believer and the munafiq. 
which we will cover insha'Allah ta'ala. So the point is that in the Qur'an and in the Sunnah we have these different kinds of parables for these various kinds of objectives. Now, Ibn Qayyim, he compiled many of the parables mentioned in the Qur'an and Sunnah in one of his books, which is one of his masterpieces, called, the book is entitled, I'lam al muwaqqi'in And basically, he listed 23 or 43, 43 parables from the Qur'an. And these 43 parables we covered when we went through the parables of the Qur'an. And like I mentioned, it was not, uh, the masjid was not open, it was during the, the lockdown, but it was live streamed. And the recordings are there, uh, available online. And Ibn Qayyim, he did this, he, he listed these parables while explaining the letter that Umar radiallahu an sent to Abu Musa al-Ash'ari. Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu anhu was one of the governors of, or one of the judges that was appointed by Umar. So in this letter, Umar radiallahu an was explaining to him how to pass judgment. So he said, use your understanding. He said, do use your understanding when you are unsure about a matter that is not found in the book of Allah or in the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Then, judge matters by analogy, qiyas. So first he said, if you have a difficult case in front of you, you're the judge, and you don't find an answer for this case in the, in the book of Allah, then use your understanding. If you can, then use analogy, which is qiyas. And he said, and acquire a good knowledge of amthal. Acquire a good knowledge of amthal parables, which are basically like and similar cases. So you don't know the answer for a particular case, try to remember a similar case. And that is the meaning of amthal. Then go with what you see is more beloved to Allah and resembles the truth the most. Then after mentioning all the parables of the Qur'an, Ibn Qayyim, he moved on to mentioning the parables mentioned in the Sunnah. And he listed approximately 40 parables. However, the Sunnah has many, many more parables than that. In the various ahadith, we have many, many more parables. Ibn Qayyim only mentioned 40. And these 40 that he mentioned are the most common ones that we hear. But there are many more, and we will, insha'Allah ta'ala, try to cover as many as we can. Bi'idhnillahi ta'ala, we will try to cover as many of these parables as we can. And basically, we will go through the various books of hadith, and we won't be following any particular order or any particular sequence. With the parables of the Qur'an, we went through the parables in the order that they're mentioned in the Qur'an, beginning from Surah Al-Baqarah, going all the way to the end of the Qur'an. But with the, with the parables of the Prophet wasallam, we won't go through any particular order or sequence, but rather, uh, we will go according to the authenticity of the ahadith. So we will start with the parables found in Bukhari and Muslim, agreed upon, muttafaqun Ali. And then after we have covered the parables that are, are found both in Bukhari and Muslim, then we will look for the parables that are only mentioned in Bukhari, and then the parables only mentioned in Sahih Muslim. Then after that, we'll move on to 
the parables found in the four Sunan. The four Sunan, Abu Dawood, Tirmidhi, An-Nasa'i, and Ibn Majah. Then after that, we'll go through the rest of the parables mentioned and found in other collections of hadith like Musnad Imam Ahmad or Muatta Imam Malik and so on and so forth. And obviously, as we go further into the other books, we're going to find a lot of a lot of hadith that are weak and not authentic. And so we're going to try to stick to the hadith that are found to be authentic, even though when it comes to using da'if hadith, the scholars have permitted using weak hadith when it comes to when it comes to fada'il al-a'mal, which is basically those hadith that encourage us to do good deeds. So the scholars of hadith, they say that as long as that weak hadith, as long as it is encouraging us to do a good deed which is authentically established in other authentic hadith, then we can use that hadith. So for example, uh, for example, we have a weak hadith that talks about Salat al-Duha. Salat al-Duha is from the Sunnah to pray in the morning at the time of Duha, the early morning after sunrise. The Prophet ﷺ used to do it and he used to encourage us to do it. And we have authentic ahadith regarding that. But now let's say you come across a weak hadith. Then the scholars, they permit citing that hadith. If it encourages us to do something good, which is authentically established. But now let's say we have something which is not authentically established. For example, Salat al-Tasabih or Salat al-Tasbih. There's no authentic hadith regarding it. So you cannot cite any hadith, weak hadith, that talks about encouraging us to pray that salah because it's not authentically established. So if we do come across those kinds of parables that uh, they, have, they have precedent in authentic hadith, but the hadith itself that we will be using, it may not be authentic, then we'll mention it. We'll mention it based on this rule that the scholars of hadith, they mention. So what we'll do insha'Allah ta'ala, we'll start today with the first parable. And we'll stick to one parable for today insha'Allah. And then next week, we'll move on to uh, more parables insha'Allah. So the first parable that we have is the parable of the believer. The parable of the believer. The Prophet ﷺ gives us the parable of the mu'min. What is the mu'min like? He compared it to something. And so this hadith, it's found in Bukhari and Muslim. It's an agreed upon hadith. And so in the version of Sahih al-Bukhari, the Prophet ﷺ says, on the authority of Ibn Umar, Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, he's the narrator of the hadith. عن ابن عمر رضي الله عنهما قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم مثل المؤمن كمثل شجرة خضراء لا يسقط ورقها ولا يتحات فقال القوم هي شجرة كذا هي شجرة كذا فأردت أن أقول هي النخلة وأنا غلام شاب فاستحييت فقال قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم هي النخلة وفي رواية عن ابن عمر مثله وزاد فحدثت به عمر فقال لو كنت قلتها لكان أحب إلي من كذا وكذا ابن عمر رضي الله عنه he says 
the Prophet ﷺ said, the example of the believer is like a green tree, the leaves of which do not fall. So the companions, they started to guess what tree it could be. So they said, it is such and such tree, it is such and such tree. Ibn Umar says, I intended to say that it was the date palm tree. But at the time I was a young boy and I felt shy to answer. This shows us some of the adab that the companions had. He was young, but he was among elders. He was among the elders. Although the Prophet ﷺ is addressing all of them out of adab, out of good manners, he stayed silent out of respect for his elders. So the Prophet ﷺ, after hearing their answers, and no one gave the correct answer, the Prophet ﷺ said, it, what, it is the date palm tree. It is the date palm tree. Basically, the answer that Abdullah ibn Umar had guessed. In another narration, Ibn Umar, he says, I mentioned this to my father Umar radiallahu an, who said that I wish you had said it. If you had said it, it would have been, you having given the answer, that would have been more beloved to me than such and such. Meaning he mentioned something very expensive. That you giving the answer, I would have been very proud of you. It would have been more beloved to me than such and such. And so this is the version of Sahih al-Bukhari. We move on to the version mentioned in Sahih Muslim. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ibn Umar, qala qa rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, yawman li ashabihi, akhbiruni an shajaratin mathaluha mathalul mu'min. فجعل القوم يذكرون شجرا من شجر البوادي قال ابن عمر وألقي في نفسي أو روعي أنها النخلة فجعلت أريد أن أقولها فإذا أسنان القوم فأهابوا أن أتكلم فلما سكتوا قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم هي النخلة In the version of Sahih Muslim Ibn Umar radiallahu anhumah, he says, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam one day said to his companions, tell me about a tree which resembles the believer. So the people began to mention different trees of the forest. Ibn Umar says, it was instilled in my mind or in my heart and it stuck there that it must be the date palm tree. So I made up my mind to mention it, but I could not do so because of the presence of the elderly who were there. Finally, when there was a hush and no one was giving any answers, Allah's Messenger وسلم, said, it is the date palm tree. And so the date palm tree is a very blessed tree the tree and the fruit. And no other tree has been mentioned as much as the Nakhla, the date palm tree, in the Qur'an. No other tree has been mentioned as much as it has been mentioned. And so in the Qur'an, it has been mentioned more than 21 times. And in the Sunnah, it has been mentioned over 300 times. Talking about it and its blessings talking about it in a positive way. And this is because it symbolizes good. It symbolizes barakah, blessings, and al-ata, giving, and generosity. And so this is why the Prophet wasallam here gave us the parable of the believer, that the believer is like the date palm tree. So now, how is the believer like the date palm tree? That's the question. For the companions, 
they understood right away. Why? Because they lived among date palm trees. They knew the significance of the date palm tree. For them, they could visualize it. Remember when we talked about why parables are used? We mentioned that they are used to, to clarify concepts that become more clear when you give a parable, you give an example. Why? Because it's something you can relate to. It's something that you have visualized. Right away it comes to your mind because you have seen this thing before. You can relate to it. You know its significance. You know that thing. And so when you compare something to it, right away you, you understand it. So the, the Sahaba, they understood it. But for us, we may not understand it. And so the day palm tree resembles the believer in different ways. Firstly, the date palm tree is beneficial to everyone, whether it is alive or dead. When it is alive, it produces fruit. It benefits the people. And when it is no longer bearing any fruit, the people they benefit from its wood, from its leaves, its branches which are used for a variety of purposes. We all know that when the Prophet ﷺ built his masjid in Medina, what did he use as the roof? What did he use? The branches of the date palm tree. Any other tree would not be able to be used as a roof. Even I mean, imagine how beneficial this tree is. Not only its wood, its branches, its leaves, but its dates. The dates are... Today, they're discovering how beneficial dates are for us, unlike any other fruit. Not only that, but imagine the seed of the date. Most of us, when we eat the date, we just throw away the seed. And today they are discovering that there are benefits in the seed itself. And you can actually buy date seed powder. They crush the seed and turn it into a powder. And the most beneficial is the hajwa date and its seed. You can find it in powder form. Today they have discovered that it has proven to prevent kidney and liver damage. We're talking about just the seed. And also it is useful in treating blood sugar problems. And people use it as a treatment. So look at how beneficial the date palm tree is to the point where even the seed of the date is beneficial. So the point is, that the date palm tree is beneficial at all times, whether it is dead or alive. All of its parts are beneficial. Likewise, the believer, he is always beneficial to others. The believer is always beneficial to others. He's always helping others. Didn't the Prophet ﷺ say that you do not truly believe until you love for your brother what you love for yourself? Didn't the Prophet ﷺ say that whoever helps his brother in a time of need, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help him on the day of judgment when he will be in need. And so many other ahadith that show us that one of the characteristics of true believers is that they are people of benefit to others around them. The second way how the second way of how the date palm tree resembles the believer, the date palm tree provides rich, wholesome fruit throughout the year and not only in one particular season. 
most fruit that we have, there's a particular time of the year when we collect the fruit and then we use it for some period of time, that fruit. We benefit from it, we eat it, and then that's it. We don't have it for the rest of the year. If you keep it for that long, it'll, it'll go bad. Not the date palm tree, not dates. And so dates are eaten fresh, they are eaten fresh and ripe, and they are also stored for the rest of the year. They are stored until the following year. And so likewise, the believer, likewise the believer, he is always producing fruits at all times. Not only in one season, but throughout the year. And when we say fruits, we mean good deeds. A true believer is not a believer, is not a Muslim in Ramadan only. He is not someone who shows his face doing good deeds only in the first 10 days of Dhul Hijjah and so on in certain times of the year. No, throughout the year he's consistent in producing fruit which are good, tree, which are good deeds. Not only that, but just like the date palm tree produces rich, wholesome fruit, The believer is also producing good deeds that are pure, meaning that there's no deficiency in his good deeds. His deeds are done sincerely for the sake of Allah. Because if you do a good deed that is not sincere, then it won't be accepted by Allah. And whatever good deeds he does, they are in line with how the Prophet ﷺ taught us. And not something that he makes up from himself. So just like the date palm tree produces rich, pure, beneficial dates, likewise the believer, he is always producing good fruits, which are good deeds, which are accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not rejected. The third way of how the date palm tree resembles the believer is that the date palm tree is pleasing to look at. It looks beautiful. Usually we see images of date palm trees on beaches and it's usually used as, you know, a beautiful scenery. Date palm trees are beautiful. They look nice and they produce pure dates. Likewise the believer he also displays a good appearance, both physically and through his conduct and his speech, his words, what comes out of his mouth are good. And so when you throw stones at, when you throw stones at the date palm tree, what do they drop for you? Dates. Likewise, the believer, when insults are thrown at him, he comes back with, he comes back with good speech. He doesn't come back with insult and bad words in retaliation. So this is how the believer resembles the, the date palm tree. And finally, the fourth way of how the date palm tree resembles the believer the date palm tree is extremely strong and steadfast, unlike other trees. In the, in the face of strong winds, storms, hurricanes, the date palm tree remains standing. And we will see this more clearer in the next parable that we will cover next week bi idhnillah where the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentions that the example of the believer is like 
a tree that is firmly rooted in the ground. That when a storm comes, it may shake, but it won't, it won't drop to the ground. It won't fall over. As opposed to the munafiq, the hypocrite. So the date palm tree is extremely strong and steadfast because it's firmly rooted in the ground. And so it could bear through the toughest of storms, the most severe of winds. In the end, it'll still remain standing. Unlike other trees. And so likewise is the believer. He remains firm and steadfast during the most toughest trials and tribulations that Allah tests him with. And here we can talk about both the shubuhat as well as the shahawat. Shubuhat being the doubts that come to our minds. Doubts about Allah, doubts about the deen of Allah. Is it the truth? Is it not? The various shubuhat that are out there. And also shahawat, our lustful desires. So, fitan, fitan are of both kinds. The shubuhat as well as the shahawat. The shubuhat cause us to fall into kufr and deviate away from Islam. And the shahawat, they cause us to fall into what Allah has made haram. And so the believer, he remains firm and steadfast in the face of every shubha and every shahwa out there. Because his iman is firmly rooted in his heart. So when, when the shubuhat and the shahawat intensify, he may shake, but he won't fall. As opposed to someone who is weak in iman. Someone who is weak in iman, forget about strong shubuhat and strong shahawat. Even the slightest of whims and desires, even something small will, wake, will make him to fall. Just like other trees. Whereas the date palm tree, it remains firm and steadfast. And an example of this is Yusuf alayhi salam. Yusuf alayhi salam was a young man and he was handsome. And he was invited to commit zina with a noble woman. And so all the factors were there to make this a very, very strong fitna. But did he shake? Did he fall for it? No. He remained firm and steadfast. Just like the date palm tree, it remains firm and steadfast, even in the strongest of winds and hurricanes and storms. And this is why in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gives us the parable of the foundation of the believer. What is the foundation of the believer like? Allah mentioned that it is like a tree that is firmly rooted in the ground. Alam tara kayfa darab Allahu mathalan kalimatan tayyibatan ka shajaratin tayyibah asluha thabit wa far'uha fi as-sama' tu'ti ukulaha kulla hinin bi idhni rabbiha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Do you not see how Allah presents a parable, making a good word to be like a good tree? So here, this is another parable. We're talking about the parables of the sunnah, but this is a parable in the Qur'an that we had covered previously, where Allah compares the good word, which is the kalima of a tawheed, which is not something just verbal, but it is something firmly rooted in the heart of the believer. So Allah compares that to a good tree. 
Allah says, don't you see how Allah presents a parable making a good word like a good tree? And then Allah explains it. Whose root is firmly fixed and its branches high in the sky. It produces fruit at all time, meaning in all seasons. And so being firmly rooted in the ground, that tree, it resembles the iman which is firm in the heart. And the branches high in the sky, this resembles the good deeds that the believer does that are going up to the heavens. Because our good deeds, they are taken by the malaika, the angels, and taken up to Allah. To Allah ascend good words, and the good deeds cause them to raise. And producing fruit all the time, this resembles this resembles the believer as long as his iman is strong, then he is always producing, meaning good deeds. So this is this is the parable of the believer. The Prophet وسلم, he compared the believer to the nakhla, the date palm tree. And there are many, many lessons that we learn from this parable. First and foremost, that the believer he is always benefiting others, just like the date palm tree. Secondly, the believer is his good deeds are continuous. The Prophet ﷺ said, when asked which deeds are best in the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha. She asked him, which deeds are the best? So the Prophet ﷺ said, Adwamuha wa inqal. The most continuous of deeds, even if they may be small. So you may do a good deed that is big, but then you're not able to continue it. Better than that is to do a small good deed that you can continue, that is something that can be persistent. And so don't look at how small a good deed may be. As long as you are persistent in it, then it is more beloved to Allah than a huge good deed that you do, and then that's it. You've done it one time, and then that's it. So the believer is like the date palm tree, continuously producing, continuously benefiting other people, not just at one time of the year, but throughout the year. And also among the lessons that we learn from this parable is that the believer, the believer, he, his appearance, it looks good. And whatever comes out of the believer of words, it is the best of words. He doesn't speak lies. He doesn't swear. He doesn't insult others and so on and so forth. And among the lessons that we learn from this parable is that the believer, the mu'min, is firm and steadfast. Outwardly, because of his iman, which is firmly rooted in his heart, inwardly. Whatever you do outwardly, it's because of what you have inside of you. Whatever good you do, it's because of what you have inside your heart. Likewise, whatever evil you do, it's because of what you have in your heart of evilness. And that's why Iman does not mean only faith in the heart. Like some people, they translate Iman to mean faith. Because faith is restricted to what you have in your heart. And so the correct definition of Iman, according to Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, is that Iman consists of belief in the heart, but it also consists of saying it with your tongue. Because you can say, I am a mu'min, 
it's in my heart, but if you don't say the shahada, there's no value to that. You're not a Muslim. So you have to verbalize it. So the scholars, they say, Iman, according to Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, is belief in the heart, verbally saying it with your tongue, and the third is actions with your body parts. So if you say you're a believer but you don't pray, then you're not a believer. If you don't do any of the, of the obligations of the fundamentals of the deen, things like salah, if you don't pray, the Prophet ﷺ said that whoever does not pray, whoever abandons the salah, فَقَدْ كَفَرْ He has disbelieved. And so, Iman is the correct definition of Iman is that it is that it consists of all these three things. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us firm Iman in our hearts that translate to actions that He subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts and is pleased with. With that, we come to the end of this session. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik ashhadu wa la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.